So what Jenny invited me to do was to tell you about Nomad V4 and the new release, but we are still several months away. And so I am unable to do that at this point. Um, but I thought I would just go through the new features that have been released in the last year and just provide information about that. And I really, I, as a clinical geneticist who sees patients a little bit of the time and uses Nomad to interpret test reports, but then also sits on the Nomad team and gets to hear about all the features as they're developed, I feel like I get a really good view of, of kind of how to use these things and, and thinking about um, our, like in clinical implementation. So I'm just going to share what I know. A lot of this is just from my seeing presentations and reading the blog post myself. Um, so feel free to interrupt with questions throughout, but the hope is to let you know some features of Nomad you may have missed. Um, so the first is when you go to the Nomad website on the main page, I am actually just assuming that everyone on this call basically knows what Nomad is, but it's a reference population database with over 180,000 people in it with a mixture of exome and genome data. And they're people from the general population, um, from studies that have already happened where they've generated this exome and genome data. So they could be from a study of migraines or a biobank or study of schizophrenia. And we don't include people who are recruited for Mendelian disease studies, um, but certainly somebody with Mendelian disease could participate in a type 2 diabetes study, they wouldn't be excluded. Um, so when you go to the main page, there's a, a banner at the top that has news, which is the blog post as we release new features. And we've more recently added this change log also, which is another place you can go. Um, and it has like smaller release features. And I'm actually just going to show you Sorry, the little pictures are in my way. So if you were to click on change log, you'd see like this how to zoom in feature is now highlighted. So on every gene page, there's a little box at the top that says uh, click to zoom. And so you can zoom in on certain exons or things if you want. Um, and so that's, you know, that wasn't like worth a major release, um, the whole blog post, but we just have like littler updates here. And so you can check that out and keep following that. Um, and then the longer, the bigger updates are here on the, the news page. So the V2, so the data sets obviously widely used. Um, there's a, this is a, from a recent paper um, by Sana Goodmanson who, that I think I referenced on the next slide uh, that has looked at the overlap between, that actually like gives guidance on how to use Nomad in variant interpretation. So it's a good paper to check out, um, but it also shows a frequently asked question that I get is which is how much overlap is there between the different data sets. And so these are the exomes in V2, these are the genomes in V2, and you can see this, these are the genomes in V3, that some of the individuals with exomes in V2 now have a genome in V3, and many of the genomes, pretty much all of the genomes, um, except the ones we apparently lost track of, are, if they were in V2, they're now, they're also included in V3. So there is a lot of like double counting if you try to add alleles across the two data sets. Um, and so what we have done to help with this is that V3 has a non-V2 subset. We don't do it the other way, but you can see it that way. And part of the reason we don't do it the other way is, is just, again, time and resources. Um, but we are moving towards having V4 soon, which will have all of the current V3 genomes on GRCH38, and will additionally have over 600,000 exomes, including the UK Biobank data, um, all on GRCH38 is like a new unified call set. I do believe that that will be ready sometime this year. It's been hard to know exactly when. Every time we make a new Nomad call set, it's just so much bigger than the last one. And so the, the problems and issues and challenges don't scale quite as we're predicting. And there's always new things that come up. So um, the team is like, this is what we are working on. Full steam ahead. We have all the sample, like the call set has been determined, but I actually don't even know how many people will be in it because it starts much bigger, but we remove related individuals and non-releasable samples. And so it, it shrinks down some. And so I don't know where we'll end up, but we're hoping over 600,000. Um, I do want to mention, actually, I would really appreciate help from this group um, to spread the word about this. Um, so we've had some people leave the Nomad team recently, and this is another thing that has slowed down development. So we currently have a posting for a PhD computational scientist and for a front end developer, Nick Watts, who like makes the whole Nomad browser and, and all the features in it has moved on to another team. Um, and so we are looking for people to fill these roles. So if you know anyone, friends, cousins, you know, any, anyone you can tell about this, um, we have links to the, ad, the job postings right on the Nomad page. Um, please spread these through your networks because that will help get you these resources faster as us having um, additional new team members to help us generate the, these data sets. 
uh, this is just showing sort of how many rare variants there are of different classes. I liked this. This is how many variants that an average individual has um, that are absent from nomad. So this is, I think, just the exome data. Um, and so if you take someone of European ancestry, um, they have about 25 to closer to 30 variants that are absent from nomad, whereas somebody from um, this is African American ancestry, typically, because we don't really actually have people from continental Africa in the nomad data set yet, but we are working on that. Um, then we have a closer to, you know, 45 variant variants that are absent from nomad. And so I, I view variants that are absent from nomad that come up in somebody's exome or genome as variants of uncertain significance that we have to deal with on clinical testing. And so you can see that while it's actually better than I actually initially thought it would be that we still have a lot of discrepancies according to different ancestries. Okay, so moving into some of the uh, features we've released in the last year. Uh, so short tandem repeats, though so these actually have the high, a very high mutation rate. They contribute the same number of de novo mutations per genome as single nucleotide variants, indels, and structural variants combined. There are approximately 60 STR loci that have been identified as causing monogenic Mendelian disease. You have to think about the repeat length, but also the actual motif. Um, for example, a biallelic expansions of AGGG motif cause this canvas syndrome. Well, if the expansion is an AAAAG motif, it does not cause disease. So there can be additional complexity to that. Um, and we use the expansion hunter um, tool or algorithm um, from uh, Dolchenko et al. Uh, that's from basically developed at Illumina. Um, and it's been run on 19,000 whole genome samples from Nomad V3. And you can read the blog post to get more details for this. Um, but this work was all done, actually led by Ben Weisberg, who's done the majority of this work here. Um, but Grace Van Noy, uh, along with others, helped, and Nick Watts was again the one who made this, uh, developed the browser for this. So there are mostly dominant loci, but all of the different kinds of loci. There's 59 S tier loci that are included in this new release, um, and some are coding and some are non coding, and just kind of a mix of different things. And we pulled all this data from this one paper here and then these other resources. You know, sort of the classic STR motifs that we think about are these three base pair motifs, but there are some of varying different sizes. Um, and so the one of the things is you actually in Expansion Hunter, you have to tell it what not just the like what the actual motif is. So like CAG and like the classic polyglutamine. Um, and so he then did a, a training first to actually like read what the variety of these motifs was for these 59 loci in the NOMAD data set. And then he trained on those variety of sequence motifs. Um, so we should have data on not just like whatever the classic motif is, but like if there are others that we were detecting in the NOMAD data set. And the best place to see all of this together um, is just going to this STR table on NOMAD, which I already opened here, sorry. Too many things getting in my way. Okay. So this is the STR table, but I believe if you go to any NOMAD page, I think there's a link to it also. So if I went to like the, the page for the Huntington gene, um, it should be somewhere on here, STR. Ah, okay, sorry. You'd have to go to the page and then you'd have to go to NOMAD V3. This is only for V3. And then this gene contains a pathogenic short tandem repeat and you click on that and it would take you to the page. But we're gonna look at, so this is all the different loci that this has been done for um, and sort of the classic motifs here where the motif is. And so you can go into um, anything you'd like. I'm just gonna go to the myotonic dystrophy repeat here just cause it's one I do use clinically or I test for clinically occasionally. You can see it's in three prime UTR. And you can, so autosomal dominant, this is, it's got the range of this sort of intermediate range and then the pathogenicity range. And then that's what we divided the data, Ben has divided the data down over here. Um, you have to remember that NOMAD is really big. So there's a lot of samples over here. And so it initially shows you in linear. So you see that like, oh, there's nobody in the intermediate or pathogenic range. You actually have to change the data to log to be able to see individuals show up here because there are just so many people with very like uh, repeated numbers in the normal range. You also have to pay attention to the repeat unit. For most of them, it's just one repeat unit. But if there was 
different um, types of repeat units. You would click here and you could look at just the ones you wanted. You could choose if you just, this is X length. So if you just wanted to look at repeat lengths in males or females, you could do that, or you could look at some subpopulation and again, combinations of these things. Uh, so lots of things you can play with there. And then coming down, I do, sorry, I think the things up here, yes, do change the things down below. Um, so down here, you can actually see the repeats um, in combination. So everyone, or, well, females for this excellent one I've selected would have two copies of this repeat. And then for uh, autosomal ones, everyone would have two copies. And so you can see like somebody who has um, this 90 to one, 90 to 91 repeats on one allele has 10 repeats on the other allele. Um, and so there's one individual here. So you can click over and like view things. And again, you can click on it and, and see more information about it. Um, and then you can also say, how old are the people who have these repeats? And so you can um, hover over these and see the age of the individuals with, with these different, uh, again, combination of, of repeats. And you can also at the bottom show read data. So you can choose, for example, if you wanted, so I will say STR calling from short read data has actually a fair number of artifacts. So some of these things that are be call, being called longer repeats here um, may not be real. You often can actually spot that by looking at the read data. And so you could say, I want to look at everything um, greater than 100, which I actually think is just one of them. But if I wanted to do something like 65, not putting a zero before it, uh, you can say, I want to look at, I'm going to, the other repeat can be any length, but this, for one of the repeats, I want it to be everything greater than 65. And it shows me there are five samples that meet my criteria. I could choose population. I could like restrict it down to some group I want to look at. And then I get those two. So this is just for the first individual, their combination of alleles. And I can scroll over and look at it and make sure that it looks real. So this is that longest repeat there. And that one looks okay. There's kind of good coverage of the region. Um, obviously the reads don't stretch the whole way across it. So we have to do long read sequencing to be able to get something like that. Um, but you can kind of flip through samples and, and see ones that see if they look real. Sorry, I guess I should try to find one that doesn't look real for you, but um, in general, like sometimes you'll come and you'll see that there's just actually like two or three reads across it and it just doesn't look very reliable. Um, but this look actually looks pretty good. So these all look fine. Um, there is some, these are probably just um, some like sequencing errors, but there are some times where you're actually looking for interrupting repeats, like different types of interruptions. And you can also sometimes see those in the intervening data. So I think that's most of it. I wanted to, and we use this RE viewer for, for this view that you're seeing here. I think that's all I wanted to say about the short tandem repeats. Are there any questions about that before I move on to the next feature? Uh, thank you. Just a very quick question. Are those reads short read or long read? Do we have plan to include long read uh, for triple repeat? So these are all short read. Um, at this point, there's no plan to, there's no plan for the Nomad team to make a Nomad with long read data. I do think there are other projects that are thinking about doing that. I know all of us has been doing a lot of long read sequencing um, and some of the new um, groups that are thinking about like the pan genome and things have been using more long read. So at some point there likely will be a better resource for long with long read sequencing, but it's not something the Nomad team is working on. Any other questions? And if there are other features, I mean, at some point we'll think about how we want to um, interact and engage with them, but right now we have only so much bandwidth. Okay, um, Ancestry and Nomad. So um, this was a, something I actually found in one of the blog posts that I thought was an important point. So Ancestry is a statistical construct based in the genetic based on the genetic variants that an individual inherits from their ancestors, race and ethnicity or social constructs and group and group people based um, instead on perceived physical, geographical, cultural, or other social characteristics. In everything we talk about and present in NOMAD, we exclusively refer to genetic ancestry and the assignments of an individual's genetic ancestry 
is, does, is not equivalent and does not negate how an individual self identifies. And in fact, there's no there's nothing in nomad that is has is necessarily related to how an individual self identifies because um, all the data, all the ancestry data we report is computationally and statistically defined by the principal component analysis. So we have no information about how any of the individuals in NOMAD would actually identify. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Mike Wilson has um, been working on in collaboration with Elizabeth Atkinson, who's now a PI um, at Baylor, along with Grace Chow, who leads the NOMAD methods team, is local, local ancestry inference. So all NOMAD version 3.1 Latino or admixed Americans, which is about 7,000 samples, um, have been used to, for local ancestry inference. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means and why we're doing it. Uh, the, except for this like subset data where we actually used it in training data. Uh, the, this inference is available for all biallelic variants with low genotype missingness, so a high call rate, and, and that have an allele frequency greater than 0.1%. So admixture is the consequence of long distance migrations of ancient populations. This is not my area of expertise at all, but um, these migrations happened through the Bering Strait from East Asia around 15,000 years ago. There was a European colonization in the Americas in the late 15th through 18th century. And then the transatlantic slave trade from primarily West Africa in the 16th and 19th century. And what happens then is as you have all this migration and, and mixing of cultures, um, you also get mixing of chromosomes that go along with that. And so while we have defined initially a nomad as somebody um, as their, their, all of like the whole exome or the whole genome from them as being European or Latino or African or African-American, um, really there's a lot of like portions of chromosomes that come from more European ancestry or a bit more African, an African continental ancestry. It's really a mix of things. And we can actually deconvolute this mix of things. So while we use the admixture program just to get a sense of um, how much admixture there was in the, just uh, for now, everything I'm talking about is the Latino admixed Americans population, uh, the exome and genomes from, from, actually this is just genome data. So the genome data from this population. And we used a 5% ancestry inclusion threshold. So of all the, individuals that are labeled Latino admixed American in B3 of NOMAD, 5% um, were from a single continental population, which you can see here, or primarily from a single population constant, uh, continental population. So fewer African, fewer American indigenous, and a fewer European mostly. 60% were from two continental populations, so mixtures as you see here. And then 35% were actually from three different continental populations. So this data is generated with admixture, but the actual pipeline we use for, that, that the team uses for local ancestry inference is different. Um, it uses the EGLE program for phasing of the variants. Once the, we have a phased VCF that uses RF mix for the local ancestry inference. Once we define the ancestry windows, they extract that with tractor, and then they assign the allele and haplotype counts using a VCF generated through HALE. And so while well, I said initially everyone was just sort of assigned the, the label of Lat Latino, Afri or, sorry, Latino admixed American, um, now the, the chromosomes have been deconvoluted -con like this. Um, so both phasing and what continental population they come from, uh, the variants come from, and so we can actually provide more information. And so I'm just gonna show you an example on one, one variant just to show you what this data looks like. Um, so I picked this variant that has been seen in call 27A1 to cause Steele syndrome and is a founder mutation in the Puerto Rican population. And so I've actually opened that page already. So um, again, so this is that same variant here. It's, I should, should say, sorry, it must be familiar. Yes, in this collagen 27A1 variant or what A1 gene. Um, you could go down and see that you know, the variant looks real and all that. Um, and so this is found in 44 people of Latino admixed, ancest admixed American ancestry, along with a few in other populations. And when you click over here on the local ancestry inference in those 44, in that allele count of 44, you can see that 42 come from the American indigenous ancestral background, one from African and one from European. 
So it can just help break it down a little bit, um, which may or may not be useful in, in parent interpretation that you're doing. Um, so this will, I, I think the plan is probably not initially when V4 is released, but, but later on we will include uh, local ancestry and forensic data for the Latino admix American populations in Nomad V4, and eventually we'll be expanding this to African and African American ancestry individuals. And one thing I do think this will help with is we haven't been very good at having representation from continental Africa, so at least now we'll be able to tell some of the alleles that are coming from continental Africa, in addition to hopefully being able to include more data sets from, from continental Africa in the, the resource altogether. Any questions about this? This is Jenny, and uh, feel free to put questions in the chat as well, if you like, through the presentation. So. I overall, like if I see a variant that's like very common in one population, but my end of my person's not of the same population, I still think if it's like benign in East Asians, it's probably benign in somebody, like somebody from uh, somebody who's African-American. On the other hand, the only time I think a little more carefully about that is if there's some kind of environmental influence that's different in that disorder. But for the most of the disorders, I think about in rare disease space, um, there we don't know a lot about the environmental components or the environmental components are very, very small compared to the strength of the genetic impact. Okay, variant co-occurrence. So I think this one has been a lot more um, used in rare disease work. Uh, so this is a method for statistically phasing two variants in NOMAD, um, and it's for rare coding variants in NOMAD V2. So I know that I'm showing you various tools that, that were being developed, um, and some are in V2 and some are in V3, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason to it. Uh, some of the rhyme or reason is whether it needs exome data or whether it works fine on exome data, in which case we tend to have done it on V2 because that's where we had more exome data versus anything that needs genome data has been done on V3 because that's where most of our genome data is. Um, but again, in the future of V4, we're hoping to move everything onto GRCH38, and we hope that um, the labs will follow so that we can just kind of build resources there. Although now the new builds of the, um, the T to T alignment and things like that are coming out. So alignments will still be a thing that we will continue to talk about. Okay, but the idea here is um, if you have two pathogenic variants in a person, um, you can't, if you just have the exome or genome sequence of the child, you can't actually tell if these are in two different haplotypes or not. Um, but if you were to know that one came from the father and one came from the mother, then you would know that they were in trans, whereas if both came from the father, then they would be in cis. And if they're in cis, they would generally not cause an autosomal recessive disease, where if they're in trans, they would. So variant co-occurrence principles is that genetic relationships between two variants or phase is shared across individuals in a population. So if two variants are in cis and many individuals in a population, then they're likely to be in cis in a, somebody else's DNA that we encounter. And if two variants are in trans and many individuals in a population, then they're likely to be in trans in somebody else's DNA. So these relationships are only disrupted by one of two processes. So recombination between variants, but because in recessive disease, we care about variants between, um, within the same gene, there doesn't tend to be that much recombination happening um, at the distance of within a gene, even for very big genes, but as the gene gets bigger, that, that does increase a little bit. Um, or things like hotspots for current mutations will definitely mess up this analysis because these mutations can, will be occurring multiple times. And so in some cases will be in cis, in some cases will be in trans if you're having the same variant enter the population multiple times. But aside from those situations, for the most part, the, these first two things hold true and that's what we're really focusing on here. So um, I should sort of skip this, but this was all work done by Laurent Francioli. Um, when he was a postdoc with Daniel MacArthur and Michael Guo, who was a, a graduate student with Joel Hirschhorn. Um, and so they have both moved on to other things, and that's part of why this hasn't 100% come out. Um, but uh, Michael's actually trying to, to get this finished up now and, and hopefully get this published and shared with the community. Um, okay, so they took them uh, actually a pretty, they tried a, a bunch of different models. Um, they actually had a little problem with overfitting of the data with some of the newer models. So they went back and just used one of this older model that worked pretty well um, from Xcofir and Slatkin. 
and they have applied it to any variant with a global allele frequency of less than 5%, so any kind of rare to semi-rare variant. Uh, we've restricted it to either coding, flanking intronic, um, so minus one to minus three for acceptor sites, uh, or plus one to plus eight in donor sites, or in the five prime or three prime UTR. Uh, for this feature to work at all, both variants need to be in Nomad V2, or you just don't have any, there's no data. Um, and you may think this is very arbitrary numbers, like there are times when you want deep intronic variants, or actually just variants that are a little further out from the acceptor or donor site. Um, these weird numbers actually are just because that's what variant effect predictor or VEP, um, the science has assigned as the flanking exons um, definition and or the near splice site definition. Um, and so we're kind of stuck with, with that for now. And um, being able to do it for everything deep and tronic would just, because we're doing combinations, would just create an immense, immense amount of data. And it's just um, a little bit computationally and data storage wise, but just like very, very expensive the more we expand this. Um, and so we haven't, this is what we're starting with. Uh, so as I said, this is basically what I said, we can select these to reduce the computational and storage burden of the data while focusing on variants like the DBA phrase important for medical genetics. These calculations, while we use the cutoff to include a variant or not based on the global allele frequency, the calculations are performed separately for each continental ancestral population in NOMAD, as well as an aggregate across all NOMAD samples. You can get to this co-occurrence lookup here by finding co-occurrence of two variants. And then when you're on a variant page, I'm always like copying these variant things. And like, this has been around for a while, but I had not noticed until Nick was like, what are you doing? Um, and it's, it has, he has added this copy variant ID button and you just like push that and then it copies the variant ID and then you can paste it in somewhere and it's in the right format. And that has been like very time saving for me now that I know that that is there. Okay, so the idea here, sorry, this is kind of small, is um, this gives you for a combination of two variants that you put in, um, which I'm just showing you kind of the results. I do have two variants we're gonna put in Next, where I will painstakingly show you what it, how it, I actually do this. Um, you basically are looking to see uh, how many samples are consistent with the variants being on different haplotypes, how many are consistent with the variants being on the same haplotype, and how many are consistent with either pattern. And then you're kind of looking if things that are consistent with either pattern should really be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, so just how often they occur by chance. Um, and so those numbers should be much, much smaller. Um, so that this is what you're seeing here. So most of the time these appear on to be on different haplotypes and that they're in different people. They only co-occur four times. Um, and that's about the number of times you would expect them to co-occur by chance, just by like um, variants, you know, uh, by like random assorted segregation and all that. Um, so this is how often you would see them by chance. And so this prediction for all of these is that they're on different haplotypes except for these two here where there's no prediction because there's not enough data. Um, and so then over here, the prediction is actually that they're on the same haplotype, again, except where you don't have any data to be able to predict anything at all. Um, but for the others, they're predicted to be on the same haplotype. And that is because they are co-occurring um, more often in the same individuals than they are in different individuals, suggesting that they're in cis. So if a variant if variants are predicted on the same haplotype, um, I would downweight uh, these, these variants as a candidate for recessive disease. It doesn't 100% mean just because they're on different on the same haplotype in Noma that they're guaranteed to be on the same haplotype in my person, but um, they're most likely on the same haplotype in my person. And if variants are on a different haplotype in Nomad, it does not confirm that the variants are in trans in the proband. Um, particularly because I actually have seen like three rare variants in a proband before, and I've had co-occurrent show me that all three are in different haplotypes, but I know this person only has two chromosomes, so um, they, they are all on different haplotypes, and that's why that, that's happening, but so I can't actually tell like what is cis and trans there, but two of them are in cis in my, that individual, just based on the number of chromosomes they have. Um, and then we need to really, exp so I think the modeling works pretty well for the population, but really how well it works for thinking about an individual person, um, we're still evaluating that. And so um, it's never gonna be a perfect method. I wouldn't base too much on it, but it, it, it is a very helpful method. Um, and so we also, um, 
got a question that we'll go into this a little bit more, but uh, we wanted to eventually develop a thing where you could put in a variant, like a missense variant, and actually ask if anyone in Nomad has ever had that missense variant co-occur with a loss of function variant. And there'll be some caveats to that, like hopefully we would return a list of the loss of function variants that that missense variant has been shown to co-occur with, um, so that you could look at those loss of function variants and see if you think those are really real loss of function variants or not, um, because if it was with some kind of sequencing artifact or some other reason it wasn't loss of function, that wouldn't be as informative. Um, so we are working on something like that right now. You have to do it painstakingly by taking the missense and, and checking the co-occurrence with every single loss of function variant in the data set. Okay, so I'm just going to show you, because we have a fair amount of time still, I'm just going to show you for these two variants in the H2A gene. So this is just the Seeker interface where we do our analysis. And if I were actually in Seeker, I could just click this link and it would take me to the variant page. Um, but when I have diagnostic reports, I don't have that option either. So I um, would have to just go into the data. The first thing is that both of these variants are in V2, that they both have allele frequencies here. So that, um, and they're both missense variants. Um, so this is something that we can actually, should be able to look up the variant co-occurrence in them. So the way I would do this more painstakingly is I would go to Nomad V2. I would type in H2A. And my first variant is an ALA 4740. I would search in the variant table. Um, so it's the G to a T at 716. Oh, sorry, not at 716. We use this 058. 058 G to a T. So I'm going to open that page in a new tab. And then I'm going to find this other one, the SIS 3358. Uh, so that's that missense variant, goes to a tyrosine, it's at position 510 in the C to a T, 510 in C to a T, okay. So that's going to get me those two variants, and then I'm going to go to the co-occurrence page, and I'm going to copy the variant ID, so here's one pasted, copy the variant ID, there's two pasted. I'm going to make sure they're different because sometimes I just copy and paste the same one over and over again. And I'm going to hit submit. And so these two variants um, don't have a lot of data on them. And this is a real life case though, where I like had a proband and I had one pathogenic variant in a gene that kind of fit with the phenotype. And so I just I wanted to know if I could tell anything about this other variant. Um, and so basically this has not been seen to co-occur in any individual um, in NOMAD. So um, in Europeans, it's predicted to be on different haplotypes. So it's very limited data, but this would be enough that I would say like this variant stays in my variants that I'm considering um, for potentially being a diagnostic variant in this case, um, but I certainly don't feel like I've proven that um, and I would need additional information, but if it's a good fit for the phenotype, I don't know, I think this is the one they actually thought that this one was. Uh, there's some conflicting interpretation on one of them and there's a question in HGMD, but um, I think it adds a little bit of information to just say there's nothing that suggests that these are in cysts and are like most likely on different haplotypes. Okay, um, so Jenny passed on my request for asking if there were any questions about um, any variants you wanted to talk about as a group today. And um, we got a response from Konstantinos. I don't know if you're actually on the call and would wanna walk us through some of this information rather than my explaining it. Uh, uh, hello. Hi. And, uh, uh, thank you for uh, 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 for looking into this. So the, uh, this is a PIBF1 uh, uh, missions uh, variant, uh, which has been uh, reported uh, twice in the literature for uh, Zuber syndrome, uh, always in trans with uh, loss of function alleles. And uh, in the first study, uh, the authors, they noted that there was a high frequency in exact 
but uh, um, they performed some functional studies and they showed that, uh, um, uh, and they had some functional evidence that this uh, uh, variant may impair ciliogenesis. And the, what they stated at the time is that uh, this variant, which has a relatively high allele frequency in uh, EXAC, they may be, may be pathogenic when in trans with a loss of function allele. So going to GNOMAD, uh, one can see that uh, this variant uh, is uh, uh, frequent in some populations, a highest allele frequency of uh, uh, 0 0.1, if I'm, I'm correct, 0. Uh, this is the variant here. So ah. it goes up to 5% in some populations. OK. But uh, uh, there are also some homozygotes for uh, the same variant. What is uh, very interesting is uh, that we had seen this variant in an individual with Zuber syndrome, a mild presentation, uh, in trans uh, to a loss of functional ill. And then we went back to the literature and we saw that uh, in 2018, ClinGen um, had included this variant in the BA1 exception list, meaning that uh, uh, there were nine variants for which the allele frequency was relatively high, but for which we had some preliminary evidence that they may have, they may be pathogenic for pathogenicity. And more interestingly, there, uh, there is another paper, a, a recent one, which um, has done additional functional studies which support uh, the pathogenic effect on ciliogenesis. So interested as we were, we looked for uh, co-occurrence of uh, this variant with a uh, loss of function once uh, in GNOMAD. And we did, we checked for all possible combinations, but we didn't find any. So we were wondering if, uh, if this can be counted as uh, additional evidence. That's a great question, and I don't have a great answer to it. Um, the reason is, I think that's the right thing to do um, to check if it's in trans to any loss of function variants in the general population, because if you never see it in trans, that should be some evidence that it is that that combination would be deleterious and not necessarily included in NOMAD. Um, I was just looking. So you have like a lot of loss of function variants that you're checking. I mean, overall, altogether, because it's very rare, it's probably like 100-ish people um, with loss of function variants. And sorry, I can't figure out what to do with that. Um, so you're not really querying like that much data and that it's just like 100 people you're looking at. It's interesting that it doesn't, I mean, it's good it doesn't co-occur, that is consistent with, it's just like a question of if it's actually like really supporting or moderate evidence even. Um, and some of it is, you'd have to kind of look at other missense variants of similar allele frequency and get a sense of like, do they also, if you did the same thing with other missense variants, would you see that those are co-occurring with loss of function variants at a similar frequency? So you could try doing the same analysis, like cross-referencing these other um, variants that are similar allele frequency. And if like all of those did co-occur with a loss of function variant, you'd be like, oh, it's interesting that this one doesn't co-occur. Um, but if none of them co-occur with loss of function variants, then it'd just be like, well, that's probably just not big enough numbers to actually like be able to see this this like this co-occurrence just isn't very likely at these low numbers. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I believe that this variant, um, which is uh, the third one in uh, your in uh, your yeah. table, has been seen three. Th yes, exactly. Uh, so there are con conflicting interpretations uh, in ClinVar, but I believe that uh, there are around three thousand uh, heter. Um, alleles uh, in uh, total and uh, around 300 homozygous persons uh, in uh, GNOMAD. But sorting out all uh, truncating variants or uh, likely loss, loss of function ones, 
we did not find any co-occurrence. So we were wo wondering if, uh, yes. Right, but the problem is there's only like a hundred people with a loss of function variant. So like just what is the chance of like those hundred people would have both this variant, which is present in 3000 people and a loss of function variant which is only present in about a hundred people in Nomad. Like that, that seems most statistically most likely that those variants wouldn't co-occur just by chance in these population sizes potentially. So what you could do is you could do the same type of analysis for like these other slightly more common variants and these slightly less common variants that are kind of similar allele frequencies, allele counts, and ask if they co-occur with any loss of function variant in Nomad, because I just don't have a sense of the expectation, right? Like, is this not happening because the combination is deleterious or is it not happening because it's just too rare of an event to see the co-occurrence by chance that you don't have enough people in Nomad to actually be able to test this question? Yes, I understand. Yeah, so you could try it with these other, I know it's very time consuming to have to enter all those different variants in, but you could try it with these other ones and just to get a sense. Um, as I said, we would love it, we, like I, it's on like my desired future list to be able to say, yeah, can I just ask about like any variant in Nomad, sorry, not desired, but any variant in Nomad and does it co-occur with any loss of function variant? Um, it's like, it that will, hopefully one day be a feature, but it, I, I actually, I don't think it will be a feature this year. So right now it's just this manual thing you have to do. Um, and hopefully eventually we will get our act together and be able to add that in. Okay, th thank you very much for uh, looking into this. Yeah, thanks for sharing the variant and asking the question. Uh, and then I see there are some, potentially some other questions in the chat, but I'll, I just wanted to mention the mitochondrial data has came out more than a year ago. So I did not include it in what I was gonna talk about today, but the paper just came out in the last year. Um, so there's now a paper on mitochondrial variants across 56,000 people in Nomad um, that is available in genome research as open access. And this is Sana's paper that I mentioned that is, we tried to write up like how to use Nomad and variant interpretation. Um, and so would recommend everyone check that out. Both of these are open access papers. Um, and then again, thanking the whole team that makes the Nomad resource. This is a huge, huge group effort, both of this team and the many, many um, over, over 150 PIs that contribute data to this resource. Um, and again, we are looking to expand the team. So I'm very interested in, in having others join. So let's see what's going on in the chat. That's great. Thank you so much, Anne. Yes, yeah, so there are. Can you see the questions in the chat? Yes, now I can. Okay, great. Uh, so the distance limit between two co-occurring variants in order to phase haplotype, the distance limit is just gene. So if it's small gene, it's very close. If it's a big gene, it's very far. So you can phase any two variants within a gene, but you can't go across genes. Um, the concern as we make things bigger, is like we don't want to we have to be careful that the, none of the data is ever identifiable. And so we don't want people to be able to like chain things along and like reconstruct genomes with this data. But as long, so as long as we keep it within genes that will protect that from happening. That's why it's not a distance limit, but a, a, a gene limit. Uh, you currently cannot check for all loss function variants or anything like that, um, but hopefully one day. So one of the things we're doing in terms of like incorporating this in as data in PM3, I just don't have a great sense of this um, thus far. We are looking at, um, uh, we're, so we're like the method release, the data is released uh, as, as is our, our normal approach um, where we've done some, some QC of it, but we still like continue to QC the data after we release it. And so we are still looking into right now um, having rare disease data that actually is phased and asking, um, how often the statistical phasing in NOMAD is actually predictive of the actual phasing in the data we have, not just in rare disease data, but in just trio data in general. Um, and so it is imperfect and it sort of ranges between like, it's like around 90% most of the time. And so we're trying to look at like where that 10% where it's like incorrect, what's going on there. And that's why like, I think it's useful data, but I just don't want, I don't know how we can make too much of it 
um, at this point. And so we, again, we're still looking into that and we'll have more. And I think based on having more data like that, we'll be able to, and so that's something also people can do with their own data, their own trio data sets is like, you can take them and like look at the statistical phasing and like ask how, how often is it right and how often is it wrong um, based on what you on having like known data sets. Um, and I think we're gonna need that kind of data and that kind of study and put that out to be able to incorporate it as PM3 or, or as, as a criteria. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, well, link to NOMAD V4 variant page we provided on the equivalent variant page in V2. I assume so. So right now V3 and V2 lift over to each other. Um, V3 will just become integrated with V4 is the plan. And so you won't need links between those, but we will still, I assume, link back to some extent into V2. Um, although we are really encouraging everyone to move to GRCH38. Um, a lot of uh, errors in GRCH37 and HG19 have been corrected there. The large groups have been working on this for a long time. Um, and so we think it's just going to be a better resource for a lot of genes. I know there are a handful of genes that actually 37 still works a little bit better. Um, and there are some genes where actually like uh, at filling in more gene duplications and other like genomic duplication events have actually made some of the short read sequencing work less well in 38. Um, but overall, we're going to encourage people to use 38 as much as possible. Um, any plans to clearly flag variants potentially related to hematic clonal expansion? Um, so this is a topic I'm very interested in, and we have done We have done something to address this, but this is what we've done. <laughs> um, so clonal hematopoiesis is with aging that there are, you can get, you can acquire variants in your hematopoietic stem cells that go to high allele frequency um, or at least detectable allele frequency in your blood. And that, that we know that these just happen with age and so it's very confusing, particularly when they also happen in disease genes, because these are actually somatic variants that are um, that are not germline. And so what the problem is actually if you go, so this is the ASXL1 gene, um, which is a response, is a haplon, actually it's unclear if it's haplon sufficient or a gain of function through truncation type of thing, um, but it's a dominant disease gene for where loss of function variants cause um, uh, severe de developmental syndrome. And so actually just to go through this. So this is, so showing you the NOMAD page with the transcript here, um, I go to looking at pathogenic variants only in ClinVar and expand to all variants. And you can see it's all these loss of function variants with an X's here. I guess there's like a few missense variants that have been purported, but it's mostly loss of function variants. And so the, the other thing you can do is you can, so this is a dominant condition. It's a severe developmental, these children often, like they often don't walk or talk. They have severe delays. You would not expect individuals with this condition to be in the NOMAD data set. Um, and if you click and look at ClinVar, people, sorry, pathogenic ClinVar variants that are in NOMAD, you actually see a handful of pathogenic variants that are actually in NOMAD. And what's happening here is that these are real pathogenic variants, but that they are, um, they are somatic when you look at them in NOMAD. So if you look at this one here, that's in seven people in NOMAD, it's a stop gain variant. This has been, this actual specific variant has been found in a number of people um, with boring opit syndrome, um, but, it, but it's in seven people in NOMAD, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and when you come down and look at it, what you find is um, that the allele balance is skewed on this. Um, so if you come here and look at the allele balance, you'll see that it's skewed, it's lower than 50%. It still gets pretty high and that, that clonal hematopoiesis that it, it's actually loss of uh, a copy of, or a loss function variant in this gene, protein truncating variant in this gene um, is a driver variant for hematopoietic stem cells. And so these variants, when you get this mutation, they proliferate a lot and they go to higher allele frequency. Um, but this variant also occurs in individuals of kind of older age. So you can see a, like a little bit of a skew in the distribution. And when we looked at these variants in aggregates, um, which we actually published on, we definitely see that there's like a, a skew in the age towards older age for these um, somatic variants. So we haven't flagged them as individual variants because I, and we don't have like necessarily like proof which ones are clonal hematopoiesis or not. The way you would prove that is you would need another tissue from the person to look for the variant in like skin fibroblasts or something. 
Um, and we obviously do not have any of that for nomad individuals. Um, and we're so we're like uncertain of how much to comment on this. So we have put this note on a number of genes that we know have clonal hematopoiesis and just sort of drawn attention to the issue. Um, but this is what we currently have. We haven't like flagged them in any other way. Kind of, we're open to suggestions, but I think some of the other hesitation to actually put a flag on these kind of things is to give too much, like the, to make people think like that we have assessed these more than we have, that if we put a flag on you know, these five that we've looked at, does that mean we have really looked at all of them? How well have we looked at it? Things that don't have a flag, are we saying those are okay because we didn't flag them when really there are just billions of millions of variants here and we obviously like can't look at everything. Um, so yeah, that's what we've done so far. So this is on a number of genes that have this issue, but probably not even on all the genes with this issue. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anne.